Right, Chris Froome's had some outrageous performances in the last couple of years, and here are some of my favourites. So, Stage 10, 2015, Tour de France, Pierre Saint-Martin, Richie Porte on the front, whittled down absolutely everyone. Team Sky did a great job. This is the one where Chris Froome's power data he released, 5.8 watts per kilo, could have been higher. And there you go, huge attack, Nairo Quintana, absolutely no response. Poor bloke's just like, how am I getting dropped by someone who's like 10 kilos heavier than me? Chris Froome just spinning it up, like, it's just insane how he managed to put such a big gap into that, that like in such a small distance. You can see he keeps going on for the stage, gets that stage win. I believe he beats Quintana by over a minute. Uh, it was a big attack and just like, I remember everyone being like, oh my God, Chris Froome is doping. And then everyone was like, oh, he's doping. Let's release his power data. See Richie Port 58 seconds back and Nairo Quintana one minute and four seconds back, which is pretty bad for him when he wanted to win the... Another classic, Tour de France stage eight, 2013, Axe Le Trois Domain. Quintana's up the road, Richie Port just blew the peloton apart. He just launched it so hard, like it just set an outrageous tempo. Everyone got dropped. You have Valverde, uh, Valverde, uh, Kreuziger, and Contador there. Contador's now like, yeah, cheerio. Um, it's just, just incredible. You can see Froome here is looking pretty, pretty gassed. Contador's like, oh, cheerio, lads, I'm going. Valverde also looks like he's going as well. It's just absolutely horrible. I don't think I've ever seen so many GC leaders get cooked. Schleck was well down the road. Same with Cadell Evans. You can see here, Froome goes past Quintana, pretty chilled. He's like, right, boys, I'm going for it. Everyone else back here is just like, oh, God. Richie Port still looks so fresh. And this is the thing that's ridiculous. It's like, Froome did so well, but also same with Richie Port. And when both of those just do well, it just looks ridiculous. Here comes Froome. He's out the, out the corner, just really launches it. And Quintana says, cheerio. There's no way I can follow the Froome dog up. And the Froome dog puts in over a minute into every single one of these contenders in about four and a half K and um, also the other thing I guess is that it's not really the last kilometer and a half is like pretty flat so here goes Richie Port just chilling out he's like Quintana you want to do some t a turn Quintana's like nah you're all right you can see there's, a, there's already a huge gap happening behind and Richie Port just looks so comfortable uh, you can see here we've still got all the rest of the GC leaders way back down as Froome Dog is just flying up the road like God, they just makes him look so easy. He just has that style, just looking down and just banging it out. And like, it was just ridiculous how far ahead he ended up finishing this stage, considering it's like mid tour and just, oh god! Like he put like two or three minutes into some of these GC contenders in one stage and like four four kilometers. Like it was just insane. Um, I was just when I saw this stage, I was like, oh god, Chris Froome is on is on some real good stuff because he has all this controversy. Is he better than Wiggins? Uh, but. This is when he signs the doubters and was like, all right, boys, I'm on the, I'm on the top stuff. And uh, managed to get the win. Richie Port came in second place, about 50-something seconds down. So there we go. On to, and let's round that corner and just sprints out the saddle. Very, very chilled performance from the man himself, Chris Froome. Just still sprinting and just like looking back and just being like, yeah, boys, did a good job today. Did a very good job today. And it's just like, keeps going around this thing, but he just finally gets it, chucks that hands in the air. Um, and this is one of my favorites. Number three, Tour de France, stage 15, Mont Ventoux. Now we've got some power data here, so you can see Richie Port launched it, then Chris Froome, uh, he launched it basically, and then it was Chris Froome and Contador who could follow it. Then Chris Froome goes around this corner, just absolutely flying at this incredibly high cadence. And again, everyone thought he was on the on the source this time. And when his power got leaked, it was like, oh, maybe he's not. But then Chris Froome basically then bridges up to Nairo Quintana, who was already up the road. Um, and then Chris Froome has a little bit of attacking with him, and they pretty much ride together. You can see here, it's absolute madness on Mont Ventoux. Uh, and this is, an, and again, one of those stages where you're just like, oh, come on, Chris Froome, try and be a bit more normal. Like, he just looks so ridiculous compared to Quintana. Quintana's a classic Colombian climber, and here Chris Froome puts in a little dig. Not a crazy, like, just holding 550 to 600 watts now, um, which obviously is insane, like, uh, after holding such a big power before, but it's not, it's not an absolute full gas attack, like, he didn't hit 1,000 watts at that point. Um, but Nairo Quintana managed to reel him back in, and with one and a half kilometers, they were working pretty well from 4K to one and a half K. And then Froome Dog's like, see ya boys, I'm going. Uh, and with just this constant 500 watts, and you can just see, like, 600 watts here, and you just know that Quintana's like, oh, God. 
what have I done? I just dragged the Froom Dog up the mountain and the Froom Dog just pulls away and like, it's just insane like how he managed to just have those like constant attacks where he can attack and then sit back in the rhythm but also be such a strong time trialist. This is the thing. People always say Chris Froome's like, oh, he's not that good at climbing. Chris Froome is one of the best climbers in the world and the best time trialist in the world and that's the thing that's just insane about the man. You can see he's still doing 500 watts after this whole stage in the third week of the Tour de France. It really was just one of those days when you're just like, Froome is outrageous. I mean, Froome's obviously on some good stuff, but so is everyone else. But sometimes you really are just like, come on. But this is my favorite stage. So he lost 30 seconds to Vincenzo Nibali on the stage before. Um, and then he got his asthma puffer, went, got all the good Ventolin down him, got the, uh, got, what's it, salbutamol. And this is actually the stage where he got pinged for 2,000 nanograms per milliliter when you're only supposed to have 1,000 nanograms per milliliter. And this is when Chris Froome had this remarkable turnaround where he was suddenly getting dropped by Nibali and then put like 30 to 40 seconds. You can't even see Nibali. He's in the green jersey for the points, uh, co points competition at this moment in time, not his normal Bahrain Merida jersey. But you can see Chris Froome is even just like swerving around, making sure that you can see that Nibali's been dropped. So Nibali put like 30 seconds into him over a way longer climb. And it's also steeper, so it's more about what's peculiar. And then on this real short climb, suddenly Froome can just do this. And you're like, come on, Froome. And then when it got announced everyone, that he uh, had the adverse an analytical findings um, for the salbutamol, because he had double the amount in his blood, everyone was suddenly like, oh, well, that sort of makes sense, how he suddenly got from, went from being dropped by Nibali to suddenly dropping Nibali on this very short climb. Like, obviously, it's a slightly different effort, but even so... Yesterday, uh, Alberto Contador was flying up Los Mastucas at six and a half watts per kilo, and today, uh, Chris Froome has managed to <laughs> managed to stay with him on this little short climb, and it really was a another day where, at the time, maybe you didn't speculate too much, but after the news came out that Chris Froome had, had got double the amount of salbutamol, it really was <laughs> it was one of those days where you're like, come on, Froome, just try and be a bit normal for some once, um, and then he he does have normal days to be fair, but I mean, if you look in this, all of these stages, pretty much are taken in this in the third week. Um, and that's where Chris Froome really does just just get that launch ability. Uh, Ari's up the road with that beautiful style. Absolutely love the boy. I uh, really do rate him. That technique is just world class. But you'll see Chris Froome's just going to come across the line with uh, Mike Woods and Contador and put 30 to 40 seconds in. You can see we've got uh, some of the old boys behind from Sunweb and we've got Walt Pools as well. And we're still waiting for Nibali. Um, so... Nibali's still coming and you're like, oh, poor Nibs. And this is, Nibs was in second position at this time. And this is really when the, Nibs had a, a big problem to try and overhaul Froome and Daug. Uh, but will Froome actually keep this welter title? Then it doesn't look likely, to be honest. Um, but yeah, poor Nibs lost a lot of time. And this is my favorite, number one. 29, uh, 2018, stage 19. Here comes Froome on the Colle de la Finestra. Just 80 kilometers. Froome's like, yeah, I'm going to go, boys. Uh, and just holds it. I mean, he put a lot of time in the descent, which isn't necessarily the climbing, but even so, like, come on, this is this is real sus, but we, we love it anyway. He's put a bit of time on, on the climb, but then after that, he then just, like, launched it on the flat and just didn't really get tired. He just held such a good pace. It was insane. Um, these guys then waited for Riken back and everyone else on the descent, and Froome did gain time on the descent, true, so it's not as sus as you might necessarily think, but he did put a lot of time. And here we've got some long-range footage. RGS, the people who own the footage of the Giro, are not exactly very nice people and they do not let me use their footage. So we've just got some fans footage here and you can see Chris Froome's got a fat gap now. The Team Sky car is just behind him uh, and he's got a, a good 15, 15 second gap here. And Froome's just, you know, looking down, just pedaling away. Uh, at this point, it doesn't look like he's going absolutely mentally fast, but I mean, they've already been climbing for so long and the climb before this, they really hit hard. Um, but when you pan back from the camera, you can see that you got Dumoulin on the front just trying to time trial across uh, and Chris Froome was just going away and Froome's turn of form I mean come on that, oh, that again was like I like Froome like 100% like he's a good bloke um, he's interesting guy but I just think um, it's very interesting some of his performances and I mean they're all on it like that's the truth like everyone's on the good stuff but I guess the thing is what, what makes him better than other people um, and I guess some of it is like sort of cadence, food, things like that. Um, but I do think Sky have some good stuff hidden around that not everyone else has access to because in reality, like some of the ways he's managed to turn around, like he was three minutes down, four minutes down, like he was looking really in not good condition. I mean, maybe he had a crash, but like, I don't know. 
I feel like Sky like to sort of put so many things out like, oh, it's a crash or lots of excuses for Froome. But like in reality, like this turnaround, the same with Zonkland. Suddenly, I just, I was, I should have bet money on the Zonkland. I was just, I know Froome's going to win it because you could just imagine Froome just was like, yeah, I want to win this stage. And he's like, doctor, give me the good stuff. And uh, he got that. And you can see that, I mean, at the moment, Dumoulin's doing well. Um, but Dumoulin just seems to have like, you know, stayed pretty consistent. But Froome suddenly on the stage was just feeling great. He just went for it, held it on the flat. And then held it on the uh, up, you know, it wasn't this mega steep climb, uh, the middle climb, I can't remember exactly what it was. And then up the Jalfaru, which is the last one, he again held a, he dropped the moonland by a couple, couple minutes. A lot of dopers like Rasmussen are saying it's, it's not that sus, but uh, I don't know. For me, it was, uh, it was a pretty incredible stage and very, uh, very not natural, as they say. Um, there are so many people speculating about Chris Froome's power data, like on the Pierre Saint-Martin, um, he released it and said 5.8 watts per kilo for 40 minutes, and then um, Tony Galapan said he did 5.9 watts per kilo and he finished two minutes back, so Chris Froome must have done more power, maybe that's a motor in his bike, I mean it's like so many things, maybe the power meters aren't reading correct, obviously there's the oval chain ring thing to take into account, which does slightly overread Chris Froome's power, but then does Sky take too much and say like, oh maybe it's like 10% off, but maybe it's only 3 or 4% down, I don't know. Um, but you can see here, we then got the, the rest of the crew who end up finishing eight minutes back on Froome. Uh, poor blokes, basically Pots of Evo did a time trial and, uh, and lost to Froome quite badly. And uh, here is the final. Chris Froome wins the Giro d'Italia pretty much on this stage. Three minutes, three minutes ahead of everyone else with an 80 kilometer breakaway. Cheers for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Sing it.